join in with Cody and welcoming everybody here this morning. We do have a good number of visitors that are with us, people that are traveling through or visiting family or visiting people that used to be here but betrayed us to go somewhere else in their life. Just kidding, Audrey. Uh, we're happy that you've chosen to be with us. We've having that, we're happy that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. It's always our goal at Hillside not just to worship God in any way that we choose. That's not the design. The goal is to worship Him in the manner that He has authorized us to. And ultimately, what we're going to be doing throughout the course of this next few minutes, and it will be more than just a couple minutes, don't worry, don't get excited, um, is to draw closer to him, to learn more about who he is, to learn more about his will for our life, um, and to seek deeply, introspectively into our lives to see if we're truly fulfilling our desire or fulfilling our obedience towards him. Um, it seems kind of superfluous to say that this lesson will be a little bit more introspective, um, but it is. It's very general in that it challenges everybody to look inside themselves to look to see if we're truly fulfilling God's commandments um, and his, our obedience towards him. So I'd encourage you to open up to your Bibles. We're going to start in Job chapter 42 in just a second. So if you would, open up to Job chapter 42. <clears throat> what you are looking at on your screen this morning is a painting by, let me get his name right, Elias Martinez, who painted this painting called Eche Homo in 1930 in Saragossa, Spain. He painted it. He wasn't a particularly well-known artist. I think he was just kind of a local teacher. And he, visited, he vacationed there several times. And so what he decided to do in 1930 was, I'm going to paint this simple little painting. I'm going to devote it, so I'm going to dedicate it to the chapel that kind of is next door to my vacation house. And it's just going to kind of be my little gift towards these people. So he painted Eche Homo in 1930, and it lasted without really a whole lot of fanfare for close to about 70 or 80 years. And throughout the course of those 70 or 80 years, Eche Homo started to become a little deteriorated. You can imagine not being a fantastic work of art. It wasn't preserved pristinely. It started to kind of deteriorate. Uh, the colors started to run a little bit. And so Elias Martinez's family decided in order to preserve this family heirloom, what we're going to do is start to take up kind of small donations here and there, anybody that wants to preserve it. And we're going to try and get an artist to come in and refinish it. And so the plan is we're just going to have somebody retouch it, get those pictures, get the colors going a little bit, just to make it nice and presentable. That was their plan. Until, that is, another local artist that was 80, year old, 80, 80 years old that lived on the other side of that chapel decided to take it upon herself to restore the painting for the family. Unauthorized, nobody really even knew she was doing it, and this was the final product. As you look at this, it looks a little bit different than what it originally set out to be. As a matter of fact, when the news caught a hold of this, it became a multi-nation story. People began to flock to it. The chapel then started charging admission. Now they're in the middle of this big legal battle. People renamed it from Eche Homo to Eche Nomo, which means behold the monkey instead of behold man. If you think it looks awful, don't worry. BBC News correspondent also thought so. He described this saying, or he described this painting as a crayon sketch of a very hairy monkey in an ill-fitting tunic. It looks awful. And this 80-year-old woman that just kind of took it upon herself to save the family some money and try to do her deed for the community ended up destroying what was originally at one point a fantastic work of art. You can go visit Eche Nomo if you want to. You have to pay, I think, five or six bucks and you can walk in and kind of look at it. It's really kind of weird. And it's even weirder to see all the lines of people that are going in to see something that admittedly does look like a monkey in an ill-fitting tunic. Uh, but why the uproar about this? Why the legal battle? Why the uproar? Why was the chapel in kind of a fit about it? I think it's pretty obvious. Eche, Eche Homo was not this 80-year-old artist's job to restore it. It wasn't hers. It wasn't her family's. She didn't even, I don't think, attend it at that chapel. It was not anything about her responsibility to fix this magnificent work of art. She took it upon herself to do that. And even though she had all the best intentions, even though she had maybe some kind of skill set, I don't know what the skill set is there. That looks like something that I would probably paint um, going to one of Jeff Jacobs' classes. But I don't know what her intentions were. She had all the best things in the world, but she failed miserably at what she was trying to achieve. So why the uproar about it? Point blank, it's because she had absolutely no right or claim in any way, shape, or form to what she was attempting to change in the first place. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, that, il that perfectly illustrates sometimes our relationship to God. Have you ever heard somebody ask, or maybe you've said to yourself, why did God make me this way? Why did God make me, if I'm just speaking about myself, why did he make me breathtakingly handsome? I don't understand it. 
Why did he make me this shape? Why did he give me this personality? Why did he put me in 2015 in Greenville, Texas to live during this time period under this administration with this type of culture? Why am I this way right now at this point in time? And sometimes we want to question God. We want to say, why this? Why that? I'm sure people overseas in Nepal are asking the question right now. Why did this gigantic 7.8 magnitude earthquake, why did it hit Nepal and kill over 2,000 people this morning? Or not this morning, within the last few days. And so we want to question God. We want to kind of shout at Him and say, why this? Why that? For this reason, what are we going on here? And we begin to question God. And if you look at the book of Job, if you look especially throughout the course of the last... 38 chapters that pretty much make up the bulk of that book, what you see is people saying the exact same thing. Well, Job, obviously the reason that you're in this horrible predicament is because you sinned. And over and over, these chapters go back and forth. Job with his friends, his friends with Job. Well, you sinned. Well, I didn't sin. Well, you had to have sinned. Well, I didn't sin. And throughout the course of the last few chapters, right before God starts to speak, Job then begins to question God himself and says, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I did not do this but I still don't understand why this is happening to me. And of course, if you read the first couple chapters and see what happens to Job, it is pretty awful. I would probably want an explanation too. But then starting around chapter 37 of Job, God starts to speak. And God starts to put Job in his place. And I think he opens up chapter 36 or 37 basically saying, you sit in your place and I'll question you like a man. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Could you draw out Leviathan with a, with a hook? Could you make the borders of the seas stop at the land right here? Do you have that kind of power, Job? And Job, after listening to that for six or seven chapters, is forced to admit, beginning in chapter 42, starting in verse 1, he said, I know, starting in verse 2, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I wish... The seven billion people that existed in this world today could understand just that one simple concept. I wish I could understand that concept. That whatever God designs to do, it will not be thwarted. We'll talk more about that here in a second. Verse 3, who is this? Starting in verse 3, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Kind of quoting God. He says, after that, therefore I have declared that which I did not understand... Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak, quoting God yet again. I will ask and you instruct me. Verse 5, Job now answers God. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye, see you, my eye sees you. Proper mode of repentance in verse 6. Therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ashes as he should have. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we get a little bit too big for our bridges. And we begin to think to ourselves, God, why did you make me like this? Why this personality? Why this time period? Why do I have these friends? Why do I have these parents? And we want to know why, 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 why? When in reality, the only thing that matters is obeying God in whatever circumstance you are. And Job's response here in Job chapter 42 is, even though I've lost everything, I'm content to know that you're still in power. And that trust and that obedience and that devotion towards God it goes a long way. I want to turn our minds to Jeremiah chapter 18. Look at Jeremiah chapter 18 like we, we read a second ago. <clears throat> Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. And he's called such because as he's looking at the destruction that encompasses Jerusalem for their years and their decades and their centuries worth of sins. As Jeremiah is looking at Jerusalem and sees people that basically had abandoned God a long time ago. What he's viewing now in Jeremiah's time period is God pretty much abandoning his people. I'm going to leave you to your own devices, and let's see how Babylon and Assyria play with you. Let's see how they handle you whenever I'm out of the picture. And as you look throughout the course of Jeremiah, you see a lot of things. Jeremiah chapter 7, this disbelief that these people have that any sense of destruction will happen. If you read Isaiah, if you read most of the minor prophets that prophesy about destruction that is eventually going to happen... The overarching response that's encapsulated there in Jeremiah 7, verses 1 through 15 is, there's no way any of that can ever happen. Why? Because I'm God's people, or I am of God's people. That sounds very similar to today's world. Well, God would never destroy me because I'm a Christian, or I love God, or I obey God. So obviously God would never do that to me because he loves me, right? That was the exact same mentality in Jeremiah 7 that the people had. God would never destroy us because we're Israel. God loves Israel. And so anybody that prophesies destruction is obviously fooling themselves. 
When you get to Jeremiah chapter 17, the tone changes a little bit. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, just a few verses before we're about to read. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 17, starting in verse 24. God writes, and he puts the condition on it that existed in that day and exists in this day. Condition of obedience. Jeremiah chapter 17, starting verse 24, he says, But it will come about, if you listen attentively, and there's the condition of obedience, if you listen attentively to me, declares the Lord, to bring no load in through the gates of the city on the Sabbath day, but to keep the Sabbath day holy by doing no work on it, then there will come in through the gates of the city kings and princes sitting on the thrones of David, riding in chariots and on horses, then, excuse me, their princes, the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city will be inhabited forever. Those were the promises of blessing that God had made towards his people, but it was contingent on that obedience. Verse 26, they will come in from the cities of Judah, from the environs of Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, from the lowland, from the hill country, from the Negev, burning, bringing burnt offerings, sacrifices, grain offerings, and incense, bringing sacrifices of thanksgiving to the house of the Lord. Verse 27, but if you do not listen to me to keep the Sabbath day holy by not carrying a load and coming into the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, all the commandments that he given them, then I will kindle a fire in its gates and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it will not be quenched. What these people were waking up to in Jeremiah chapter 17 starting verse 24 is our obedience and protection. Let me phrase that. Our protection and blessings from God is contingent on our obedience. And if we don't obey God, it doesn't make a hill of beans who we are. It doesn't matter if we're Israelites. It doesn't matter if we're Gentiles. God will not bless us. And that's the realization that the Israelites had to come to. And ladies and gentlemen, I wish modern day Christians in Israel world would get that through their heads as well. That it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what you do. And you can believe all day long that God will never punish you because of your disobedience. You can believe that all day long. But it wasn't true then. And it's not true now either. And what God does in showing Jeremiah this illustration that he has that Lee read for us a second ago. When you get to Jeremiah chapter 18, the illustration is a very simple one. Between the potter and the clay. Look at this in Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18, starting in verse 1. This is the parable, this kind of word picture that he's trying to show Jeremiah, trying to communicate it to these people. He says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. And then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. Verse 4, But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. A very simple illustration. But what Jeremiah witnesses is something that probably happens a hundred times a day, all over the world, all over everywhere, happens over and over again. But what he's seeing is the mastery of this potter, that he can take a lump of clay and literally make it into anything that he wants to make. And if it spoils, if it has a defect, guess what that potter has the authority to do? He has the authority to wind it up and start all over again. That's the authority issue that God is trying to convey to Jeremiah and vis-a-vis -vis trying to convey to the Israelites. Look at verse 5. <clears throat> then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does? And the rhetorical answer to that rhetorical question is, Absolutely. Behold, like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down or destroy it. But if that nation against it, which I have spoken, turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. Guess what? I have that authority. Verse 9. Or at another moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. And if it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good which I had promised to bless it. Because guess why? I have that authority. Verse 11, so now then speak to the men of Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, thus says the Lord, I am fashioning calamity against you and devising a plan against you. O oh, turn back each one of you from his evil way and reform your ways and your deeds. He's once again trying to get them to repent and obey the exact same message that had been preached for over 500 years to this point. Well, look at how he continues in verse 12. Now he brings the people into it in verse 12. But they will say, and God knows this, they will say, it's hopeless. For we are going to follow our own plans. 
And each one of us will act according to the stubbornness of our heart. What a horrible disposition these people had towards the will of their God. What God is saying here, communicating there, starting in verse 5, going through verse 11 is, I have authority literally to do whatever I want to. And if I see that Israel needs to be purified, needs to be punished, it needs to be blessed, then I can do all those things. But what I'm asking you to do is repent and obey me. That's it. One of those sounds a lot simpler than actually do kind of things. But in verse 12, what were the people's response? That's almost impossible. Because we're all just going to follow whatever it is that we want to do all the time anyways. And because of that, God doesn't really have any other choice except to punish them. Except to leave them. Except to pretty much abandon them to their own vices. Let me ask you a question this morning. Why are you here? Why did you decide to get up and come to Hillside Church of Christ to sit here and listen to a guy that is not nearly as handsome as he tried to pass off earlier, try to talk about the Bible, try to talk about Bible things. And you probably will say at some point, well, it's because I really like sitting next to Sandra Duncan. I just enjoy the way she sings, and so I really enjoy coming here and being with her and being with the rest of these lovely folks. And that's a great reason. Or you may say, well, I came here this morning because I want to worship God in the only way that I know how, which is according to the Bible. That's the reason I came here. And that's a great reason, too. But I would bet probably a subset of all those reasons is I want to study God's words so that I can know how to be closer to Him. I want to know and I want to read, I want to study, I want to dive into, and I want to meditate on what God has to say. Now let me ask you a question. What happens when what you read and what you study and what you meditate and what you think on disagrees with your lifestyle? What's your response to that? What's my response to that? Is it similar to verse 12 when Israel said, well, I know what God says, but literally that's just, that's just beyond reason. That's just absolutely impossible because I know what he says, but I know what my heart says, and so I'm going to follow that 10 times out of 10 because I don't care what that has to say. Or even worse, I've just rationalized or ignored that out of my mind because I disagree with it, and it can't possibly mean that. Is that my response to the Word of God? Is that my response to what God tells me to do Day in and day out. Or do we have the attitude of Job? Where he simply says, I repent and sat cloth and ashes. I think too often times when we begin to question God, we begin to judge him based on our perspective or based on our reality or based on what we think should happen. We flip Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 around. You know what Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says? Behold, I will make man in my own image. We flip that around we begin to say, behold, I will make God. My own image. You remember Romans chapter 10? The Israelites, not wanting to acquiesce to God's righteousness, created a righteousness for themselves. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we do that. Sometimes we don't want to know what God has to say. We don't want to care what God has to say. And so instead of that, we create our own form of reality that we're going to live in. Has our own rules, has our own punishments, has our own blessings. And we quite frankly don't care what God has to say. One of my favorite stories in the entire Bible is in Jonah. If you would, flip over there. Jonah chapter 1. I love Jonah chapter 1 because what it does is place what we're talking about right now in a very real and very literal sense. And the false notion that some of us have that we can create our own reality, our own notion of rules, our own subsets of what we want to believe in, and think under the illusion that God's going to care one bit about what we want to have. Now, does God listen to our prayers? Absolutely. Does he intercede on behalf of the righteous? Absolutely he does. But will he be patient when we try to twist his rules to what we want to do? Not a chance. Look at Jonah chapter 1. I love how brief this description, this story, places what we're talking about this morning. In Jonah chapter 1, starting verse 1, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry up against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Very simple commandment. Go up to Nineveh, preach against it, because they are an extremely awful and wicked people, and they need to know how to repent. Verse 3, you've read the story before. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish, the polar opposite direction from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the ship, and went down into it with them to go to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You will not find a person more dedicated to avoiding the word of God than Jonah in those first three verses. Somebody that clearly did not want to have any association with God's commandments. Verse 4, how did God respond? 
The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the sea was about to break up. Verse 8, as this storm is kind of coming up and the tempests are gathering, all the sailors begin to say, well, what's happening to this? Obviously, somebody made their God upset because this is not normal. So we're going to start throwing stuff overboard. We're going to start casting lots. We're going to find some way to appease the gods. Verse 8, they get around to Jonah. And they say to him, after they discover that he's the one, they say to him, tell us now, in whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? What's your blood type? Why are you here? All these different questions, 20 different questions. Boom, boom, boom. Verse 9, he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and dry land. He does now. He did it when he got on the boats. Verse 10, then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Even the Gentiles realized the ridiculousness of what he was attempting. Verse 11, so they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy, and Jonah finally getting some kind of sense of reason. Verse 12 says to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, that the sea will become calm for you. For I know on account of me this great storm has come upon you. They do exactly that. The storm becomes calm, and all the sailors begin glorifying God. Question. What did Jonah realize in verse 13 that he didn't realize in verse 2? He realized that he can't run from God. He realized that he can't hide from what God wants him to do. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you've ever tried to board a ship and go to Tarshish. I think probably all of us have at various times. All of us have tried to escape what God wants us to do. All of us have tried to run from whatever it is that God's after. Yeah. And try to avoid what he wants us to real or what he wants us to do. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to get very real with you. There are three things. I know it sounds very typical to say three things. I always think in threes for some reason. But there are three things we need to realize this morning. And not just this morning, but tomorrow morning, the morning a week from now, the morning three years from now, when you're not even thinking about what you wore this morning, what you ate for breakfast. Three things we need to realize. Number one, God's will will always, always always reign supreme. It does not matter what I think, and as genius as I think I am, as smart as I know Jeff Triggers is, and as compassionate and as loving as I know Randy is, it does not matter what they think about God if it disagrees with what he thinks about God. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. It's a very powerful passage to repeat it, not only here, it's repeated in Romans chapter 14, it's repeated in Philippians chapter 2. Isaiah 45 has an enduring principle I think is worth mentioning. It's worth reading, rereading. We like to say it's always good to cross stitch it, put it on your wall. Isaiah 45, starting in verse 21. Isaiah chapter 45, starting in verse 21. Isaiah writes, declare and set forth your cause. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And is there is no other God besides me? A righteous God and a Savior, there is none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. That's the plea that he's making. For I am God and there is no other. Remember when Moses was sent towards Egypt? You remember when Moses asked, who sent me? God says, I am. Well, who specifically? I am. I am God. There is no other. Look at verse 23. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness, and will not turn back, that to me, verse 23, every knee will bow, and every tongue will swear allegiance. They will say of me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Men will come to him, all who are angry at him will be put to shame. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and will glory. In this instance, what I believe he's referring to is the idea of all bowing the knee under the gospel towards God. But when Paul uses it in Romans chapter 14 and in Philippians chapter 2, what he's addressing there is the eventuality of everybody acknowledging God's sovereignty. It's the same argument he's making here, just expounded upon. What we need to realize as moral human beings is that it doesn't matter if you do it now or if you do it on Judgment Day. At some point, you will bow before God. And it doesn't matter what you think and what I think right now. And what I believe about God's laws then or what I believe about God's laws now, I will bow before God. And you hear people say all day long, well, he's not my God. I didn't ask Jesus to go on the cross for my sins, so why should I bow to him? It doesn't matter. Because of the simple fact that he is God, 
And because he created you, he created your right to argue with him. He created the breath in your voice to yell at him. He is God. And that's something I think all of us need to realize. What we find so often is we find the fulfillment of literally Acts chapter 22. Whenever Paul is detailing his, not conversion experience, but the experience that he had on the road to Damascus. And as he's walking to the road to Damascus, you remember this great light shone upon him. And Jesus is standing there, and only Paul really can identify it. You don't see that in Acts 9, you see that, I think, in Acts chapter 24. But only Paul can identify it. And he says, who are you seeking? You remember Jesus' response? I am the Lord who you're persecuting. And Acts chapter 26 adds on another subset to that that's not mentioned in Acts chapter 9. He says, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. And what did Jesus mean by that? What Jesus meant by that was, you can argue... And you can complain, and you can do whatever it is that you want to by persecuting the church that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, was indestructible. Or you can fight against Christians, or you can rebel against my cause, but nothing you do will ever amount to anything if you're battling against me. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something right now. The gospel has the power to change lives. It does, honestly. That's what the whole gospel means. It has the idea of good news of God that literally can change anybody's life. Just because you heard the gospel doesn't mean it will change your life. You still have to acknowledge it. You still have to accept it. You still have to obey it. And then it will change your life. Could Saul, the art, I'm sorry, I was about to say the artist formerly known as Saul, could Paul have rejected the word of God on the road to Damascus? Absolutely he could have. He could have rejected the word. He could have ignored the vision. He could have gone on about his business and persecuted Christians and killed everybody he came into contact with. But would that have helped him one bit? No. Because he was fighting against God. It is hard to kick against the goats. And when God's will reigns supreme in this world, which it will ten times out of ten, the only possible measure is to simply bow the knee to him. I don't think anywhere is this more perfectly illustrated than in Luke chapter 15. Many of you probably recognize it as soon as the thing came up on the board as the parable of the prodigal son. One of the most famous parables of Jesus for a lot of good reasons. It has a lot of truths inside of it. It has a lot of very interesting things to say. And all we're going to do is encapsulate that middle section. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. It says, a man had two sons. You kind of get a little Jonah bit inside of this. Shades of Jonah. Verse 11, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Like every good 17-year-old, he thought and believed with all his heart he knew better than his father. That's what everybody does when they're 17. Verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together, went on a journey into a distant countryside, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Notice the fact that the father did not chase him into that country. Verse 14, now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. What a shock. Verse 15, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and to one, I'm sorry, he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods the swine were eating, and yet no one was giving anything to him to eat. Verse 17, here's that little Jonah click in verse 13, comes to his senses. And he said the words, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. What he's illustrating Luke chapter 15 is a principle that everybody that has departed from God realizes eventually, hopefully, prayerfully. That a life lived outside God's kingdom is no life at all. Probably most people at some point in their life have thought to themselves, I know better than God. And his rules regarding premarital sex, his rules regarding drunkenness, his rules regarding marriage, divorce, and remarriage. His rules regarding worship styles and what's pleasing to him. I know better than what he does. But what those people will inevitably realize is that he who defines the way to get to heaven, or he who defines heaven, gets to define the way to get to heaven too. And that any life left outside of God is literally no life at all. Why do you think God puts these rules in place about Premarital sex, about drunkenness, about worship styles. Do you think it has anything to do with the fact that he's just doing this all for amusement? Everything to do with the fact that he knows what's best because he is God. There's something else we need to realize. We also need to realize that God can show purpose in spite of our failure. And that word, <coughs> our, needs to be underlined. 
It should be one of the most comforting things that we will ever understand in our life. That it literally does not matter what depth of despair you came from. It doesn't matter if you are a murdering alcoholic on death row. God can make something like that. Many of us have probably heard the story of Jeffrey Dahmer. I won't go into the details of what he's done in his life. And Jeffrey Dahmer has since been executed, and rightfully so, by the laws of the land. But Jeffrey Dahmer unleashed an awful, awful torrent of crime on the West Coast. I think it was, what, the 60s or the 70s? Unleashed just this despicable torrent of crime. But after he had been sentenced on death row, there's a lady there near the church, near where the prison was, reached out to a preacher that she knew and said, I would love for you to go and talk to this person. This person had heard of Jeffrey Dahmer. It's very much an Ananias type situation. I've heard of what he did. I don't want to go talk to him. But Jeffrey Dahmer had eventually had communication with this preacher. The preacher then sent correspondence course to this guy. They eventually got together. Jeffrey Dahmer, not long before he was executed, you can read about what he did, not long before he executed was baptized in the name of God. He turned his life around. Now, let me ask you this. If that can happen to Jeffrey Dahmer, don't you think that can happen to any one of us? The truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter how far down you are. It doesn't matter how despicable you think you are. God can create anything out of our failures in life. As a matter of fact, Paul uses the same example of the potter and the clay to illustrate the same idea in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, Paul is illustrating this ridiculousness of some people's opinion that God could do anything with Gentiles. If you had told a bunch of Jews that the Gentiles were worth anything, they would have laughed at you. If you had told the Jews in the first century that they could be worthy of eternal life alongside Jews, they would have stoned you for blasphemy. But Romans chapter 9, starting verse 14, what Paul is illustrating in these verses is not just the possibility of that, but the reality. Romans chapter 9, starting verse 14, it says, What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. There's that authority once again. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So, verse 18, he who has mercy on whom he desires, and he harms whom he desires. That's the authority of God over and over and over and over and over again. Verse 19, the argument then comes up from the Jews towards Paul. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, verse 20, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Verse 21, or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, verse 20, so I love Paul's thought project here. What if God, though all will, or although willing to demonstrate his wrath, to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? He's talking about the Gentiles. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he has prepared hand for glory. Even us, whom he also called, not from Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. The Jews could not fathom, and I think it's hard for us in 2015 to really understand this, but the Jews could not fathom a world where the Gentiles were accepted by God. That just didn't simply resonate with them. And what Paul is demonstrating here in Romans chapter 9 is, what if? God had made some vessels for glory, some vessels, vessels for unglory, or for disglory, for bad glory, whatever it is. What if he made from those same bad vessels? What if he made something out of them? What if he took those vessels that were designed for dishonor, there's a word I'm looking for. What if he had taken those vessels that were designed for dishonor and made something out of them? Would that not show even more in spades the glory and the honor and the power and the authority that God himself wields? You can't read Romans chapter 9 and get to verse 28 and not say, absolutely. God has the power to literally show purpose in spite of any single one of our failures. We don't have time to read Genesis chapter 37. You've probably heard the story before. Genesis chapter 37, Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers who are very mean and very nasty and very evil to them like every good older brother should. They sell him into slavery. That's actually better than what my brothers did to me. But in Genesis chapter 37, they're probably thinking at that point, we're never going to see this kid ever, 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 ever again because we've sold him for 30 pieces of silver and he's 8,000 miles that direction. You remember what happens in chapter 50? In chapter 50, these same people, you kind of see this prodigal son with the famine kind of instigating everything. These same people have a famine. They go towards Egypt and yet who do they see eventually? 
They see that same person that they sold into slavery, now sitting second in command to Pharaoh himself and in charge of their physical destiny. If I don't want to give you grain, I won't give you grain. And they were obviously scared of them. And you remember what Joseph's response was back to them? He says, you sold me into slavery. Here's the key phrase. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Do you think Joseph probably thought at any one point in time after he had been sold into slavery and was sitting in the back of that cart and traveling 3,000 miles over the desert that he would ever ascend to second in command over Egypt? Probably not. Probably just wanted to live a nice, decent life. That's my at least understanding of it. But yet God took this impossible situation and turned it into something fantastic and preserved his people through it. And you can make the same argument with people like Esther, and you can make the same argument with people like Ruth, a widow woman who literally had no future in the land of Israel. Yet ended up marrying one of the most prosperous people in that city and becoming a descendant of Jesus Christ himself. Can God create something out of nothing? Absolutely he can. He wanted to do that with Israel. But you were unwilling. He wants to do that with us. The question is, are we unwilling also? Last thing that we need to realize, and this is one of those also easier said than done kind of things, Everything to his glory is ultimately for our benefit. We asked a question a second ago, why are you here? What is your purpose for being here? And every person here this morning probably has a similar reason that falls into that vein of, I want to get closer to God. I want to know more about him. I want to know how I can be better pleasing to him. That's probably what most people are thinking here today. I want to study. I want to learn. I want to grow closer to him. And then we ask, we ask the logical question, what happens if what he says disagrees with what you believe? And the obvious answer to that is, well, somebody's got to change. Either God's got to change or I've got to change. God's not going to change. So I've got to change. And let's say you're reading the scriptures and you're thinking to yourself, well, how can I get closer to God? And you start to read the passages about lust. And you start to read the passages about adultery in your heart towards somebody who's not your spouse. And you start reading about that. And you match that phrase with your sin of pornography. And then you think to yourself, I've got to make a change. And you can put XYZ sin, whatever you want to, in place of pornography. But you think to yourself, I've got to make a change in my life. Because what my life is right now is not what God wants it to be. Do you think that change is going to be easy? Do you think that purifying process that you'll have to go through in your spiritual life. And maybe it's that you can't stand your wife. And God says that you need to love your wife. God says that you need to respect and honor your wife. But you just don't like her. And now, I hate that expression, to fall in and out of love. That's not even remotely accurate. And I know because I know everything about marriage after two years. But you have to ask yourself, what if what I believe about my spouse is not what God wants me to be doing? That changing process to where you get rid of that sin of pornography and begin to embrace what pure love is all about. Or that process where you begin to stop with your preconceived notions about your wife and about your perceived failures of whatever she has, and begin to believe that she's something worth treasuring. That process, no matter what your process is from sin to holiness or righteousness, that process is not going to be fun. Because it will involve a lot of habits that you need to change, a lot of mindsets that I need to change in order to get right with God. That's not going to be fun. But what we realize throughout the course of that process, it may take 10 minutes, it may take 10 years. But what we realize throughout the course of that purification process is that it's ultimately for our benefit every single step of the way. And we realize at the end of it, not just at the end of when we finally conquer whatever it is that we're conquering. When we're standing on Judgment Day, we realize every single thing was worth it to align myself with what God wants me to do. I want to look at the all-important passage here in James chapter 1. James chapter 1 is the obvious phrase that everybody knew we were going to come to. And we could have done the arbitrary and easy thing and stopped at verse 4. Look at James chapter 1, though. We'll look at this in context. We won't read all of down to verse 18. I just put it up there to mask what we actually are going to read. A little tricky like that. James chapter 1, starting verse 2. This is the standard phrase. Consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You have to understand the time period in which James is writing. If you read there in verse 1 and 2, or at the end part of verse 1, he's writing to the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad because of the persecution, people that would undergo quite a bit. So verses 2 through 4 make sense, and what he's describing is you are going to undergo persecution, you're going to undergo trials, but be patient with it. 
because let it have its purifying, perfect work within you. Jump down to verse 12. He says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, verse 13, when I am tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted away when he is carried away by his own lust and enticed. Verse 15, Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Verse 18, In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. What he is showing, especially to these Jews who have become Christians, is, you are going to undergo trials, you're going to undergo tribulations, but all of those things have a purifying process. Why? Verse 18. <laughs> because he's bringing to us a first fruits of his creatures. You know what we can do now, 2,000 years after most of these trials we're at? We can look back and we can say because Christian X, I don't know, I was trying to think of a creative name, but I'm not that creative right now, but Christian X endured under the reign of Domitian. And Christian Y endured under the reign of Marcus Aurelius and his awful son Commodus. And because those guys did, then I can too. I challenge every single person here this morning, literally take the next hour, take the next week if you want, and try to find any place in Scripture where God punishes or tortures or puts people through trials and temptations simply for his own amusement. Simply because he just wanted to. And somebody could make the argument that Job simply was going through these trials because God has some kind of ego move towards Satan. That totally blasphemes what that story is all about. But somebody could say, well, Job lost everything because God was trying to prove it towards Satan. That's not even close to true. You know how I know? Because James chapter 5 verse 11 points back to Job and uses Job as a model of endurance for everybody up until now. What Job didn't realize at that point was that people 5,000 years down the road would be reading his story and thinking, because Job did it, I can. And Christian X that suffered under the reign of Domitian, people 2,000 years later, because he did it, I can. He grew himself, I can grow myself. He went through this, I can go through this. Persecution is never far but what it creates inside of us is a refining process that takes all of our little indiscretions, our little temptations, our little trials, our little sins that we like to tuck away. That heat of trial and that heat of those temptations burns that up. To where are you guessing? We're a vessel for glory and for honor towards Him. There's a song that we sing sometimes. I don't know when the last time we sang it here was. That song, Let Him Have His Way With Me, it's much more than just an admonition to just acquiesce to the command of God. It's a plea for God, or a plea for us, to let God's refining work take us through the process of making vessels. That's what I challenge every one of us here this morning. If you would, go ahead and open up your song, which is song number 50. We're going to read that here in just a second. We talked about all these different things that God can do. And certainly we want to go through all those over and over and over again. And I hope that these three things have been not only important for us to realize, but also things that we can grow out. Things that we can put as foundations in our faith and take those things to the bank. Let me tell you there's one thing that God can't do. We talked about it in a second. God cannot, at least right now in this moment, tweak your mind and manipulate your heart to serve Him. Now make no mistake, at some point, no matter what your disposition is right now, your need will bow towards Him. But whether you do that now, and hear the words of good and faithful servants, or you do it on Judgment Day, and you hear the words, depart from me, for I never knew you, that's your decision. And that's your call, and it's my call to make right now. I can't guarantee you tomorrow. I can't even guarantee you'll make it a cracker barrel for lunch. But I can promise you this opportunity right now to get your life right with God. Won't you come as we stand in this